Okay. All right. So thank you, Guido. Thank you all for being here. Um, so thanks to the, actually the to two previous talks, I don't need to introduce as much as I thought the Schrodinger problem and um, the uh, Wasserstein spaces. Um, so maybe I can say that what I want to talk to you today is a kind of generalized Schrodinger problem that I will uh, motivate in a couple of slides. Um, and so here, maybe I can go a little bit fast. Maybe let me say that uh, we can start by choosing a state space X, which for simplicity, I will choose often to be, you know, for this talk, um, let's say Euclidean space RD. But in many cases, uh, things work um, as well if you take a domain of a Euclidean space or a manifold, or even in some cases, uh, discrete structures such as graphs, okay? Um, and just to fix the notation, the P of X uh, is a space of probability measures, and to this space, I add this Wasserstein metric. Um, so here, maybe I can go a little bit fast, uh, and this is the benamou brunier formula that we've seen uh, in the previous talk. Okay, so this is a, a distance on the probability measures, and this distance has a geodesic, right, it's an action minimization problem, so we want to think of it as uh, defining geodesics, and uh, therefore um, our probability space can be seen as a manifold. Okay, so this is what uh, you can call the uh, Wasserstein space. And um, in the previous talk, uh, Trifon showed uh, what a typical geodesic might look like if you uh, have two Gaussians as endpoints. And here I want to show you uh, maybe a 2D example. Um, so the picture here is the initial distribution. So it's a distribution uniformly supported on this square. So the black region has no mass. And uh, this is what a geodesic uh, look like. Okay, maybe, maybe I can do it again. So this is uh, another work that I did about numerically computing this kind of uh, geodesic, right? So the final distribution is uniformly supported on this star, right? So you see you have this kind of translation. Um, type of phenomena. Um, and uh, now I can uh, introduce my Schrodinger problem, like it's kind of generalized Schrodinger problem. And um, as we've seen in the previous talk, you can introduce a Schrodinger problem uh, in a little bit different ways. So you could use, for instance, the language of stochastic calculus or PDEs. And here I want to focus on a slightly different viewpoint, a uh, more geometric viewpoint, right? A Wasserstein geometry viewpoint. So you start with the potential F on the probability measures, and you're interested in this um, control gradient flow problem. Okay? So you see that here, um, the problem looks pretty clean, right? Because it's written in geometric language. But of course, these norms and these gradients, they hide infinite dimensional manifolds. Okay? And um, so you minimize over density and uh, vector fields B. So B is like a control. And the way your mass moves is influenced by two terms, B, which is you know, the control, um, and another term, which you don't have a control over, some kind of external force, if you want, okay, uh, which is minus a gradient. Right? And here is the Wasserstein gradient, so, right? so the, the gradient taken with this uh, Wasserstein metric. Okay? So we enforce the endpoint constraint. So we start at a mu and we finish at mu. And um, the objective function that we want to minimize is this uh, kind of quadratic you know, Wasserstein metric. So of course, unless you're already a little bit familiar with this uh, you know, Wasserstein geometry, uh, it might be not so clear what this means. So below, I added a more explicit uh, PDE version uh, where the terms are more explicitly uh, um, explained. Okay? Uh, and so we've seen in a previous talk the Wasserstein gradient and also uh, the Wasserstein metric. So this is the problem that I'm interested in, right? So this is what I call a generalized Schrodinger problem. And uh, maybe this is like kind of like a cute, like a nice picture to have in mind, right? So this represents this infinite dimensional uh, Wasserstein space. We uh, have the two endpoints mu and nu fixed, and we want to find a path rho t, which connects one to the other. Uh, and in green here, I, uh, I, I, I drew the uh, gradient flow. So if you are very lazy and you don't want to spend anything, so you take b equal to 0, you see that you follow the gradient flow. Okay? So this, you don't spend anything. But of course, you absolutely need to enforce the constraints. So you do need to spend a little bit of, of energy, and you can control right, your path uh, safely to you. Okay? And this is like this kind of uh, gradient field that wants to you know, push you towards maybe a minimizer of f. 
Okay, so this is like the picture. And to motivate it, so now I can go actually pretty fast. So this is what Trifon was talking about, about the original motivation between sugar, right? We, you start with a distribution u, and you observe an unlikely distribution u, and you think, okay, what's going on? And so it turns out that this problem, right? So it's not obvious at all the way I'm saying it, but this problem is actually the same as what I just presented. Right? in the entropy case. So this problem is actually equivalent to a control gradient flow of the entropy. And again, also, this was mentioned before, uh, maybe another motivation is that um, the, the, the Schrodinger problems can be seen as regularization of the optimal transport problem, where the only term that's different, especially written in this form, uh, is the right-hand side here, the gradient of f. So if you take the control gradient flow of zero, if f is zero, then you recover the original right, geodesic, the original metric of your space. Okay. Uh, in the uh, classical Schrodinger problem, but in the entropic problem, the, this equation is a Fokker-Planck type of equation, so the term that you add is the diffusion term. Okay. For a different f, it might uh, you know, model different things such as interaction or slow diffusion, et cetera. Here, I'm, so far, I'm just presenting like the structure of the problem, so I'm not really giving you any type of assumptions of f um, at this point. Okay. Oh yeah, and this is, uh, yeah, so maybe I can go a little bit fast on this, but this would, uh, if you work on discrete spaces, this would uh, correspond to the original Schrodinger problem, where, you know, um, like I said before, you have a map, okay? So you want to match the blue dots to the uh, orange dots according to some cost. And when you add diffusion, then you have uh, maybe more connections, right? Okay. So now let me dive in a little bit uh, in the classical Schrodinger problem, which I wrote here. Okay, so this is the classical Schrodinger problem. Um, and um, oops, the first thing you can do is, um, you know, write the optimality conditions. Uh, so your control B, is a gradient uh, at the optimum, and this is not so uh, surprising in the context of optimal transport. And the two equations that you obtain, the first one is this Fokker-Planck equation, and the second one is a Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. Okay. So this system is pretty complicated for a few reasons. One of them is that you have a boundary type uh, problem. Okay. And another uh, reason is that you have a coupled system of PDEs, which is uh, nonlinear, and, um, and couple, right? So um, even though these two PDs, you know, are not, are like a pretty classical, when you couple them, you might not expect to get explicit solutions, right? Um, but it turns out that uh, there is a transformation, like a change of coordinates, the half course transformation, which will allow you to uh, actually get explicit solution. So this is how it works, you change from the original variables rho and phi right, into two new variables, eta and eta stars. And uh, so this is the formula. And once you write the optimality condition in a new variable, uh, you get a system of a forward and backward heat equation. Okay? So now you get two PDs which are uh, linear, but more importantly, decoupled. Okay? And so at this point, you could uh, right, integrate out the, the, the Laplacian and get the you know, Gaussian kernel solutions, okay? So this is kind of like a little miracle, right? You might not expect this, and uh, it's uh, provided by this half course transformation, and that was the starting point for uh, this work, right? Try to maybe say a few more things about this half course transformation, okay? The system is still like not trivial to, to, to solve because you have this boundary condition, and that's where you could use this kind of, uh, you know, alternative minimizing uh, synchron type of method. Um, so let's shift a little bit the perspective. The original classical Schrodinger bridge problem that we started with was an action minimizing problem, and we know that when we have a type of Lagrangian minimizing problem, there is a dual perspective involving Hamiltonian. Okay, so in particular, we can define a Hamiltonian. I didn't write the formula here, but it's not so complicated, just to not overcrowd the slides, right? But we know that the optimality conditions of the minimization problem can be written formally as a Hamiltonian flow. 
okay, in, in here in row and file variable. Okay, so this is just like uh, classical. Okay, now let's see what happens when we write this optimality condition in the new variables given by Hauptkohl, call eta and eta star. Okay, in the so you define the so-called the Hamiltonian, right? So it's simply the Hamiltonian but in the new variable, and then you see that the new equations they uh, keep the form of the Hamiltonian equation. Right? So you still get a Hamiltonian flow. And so this says that um, this Hofko transformation is not simply a way to uh, simplify your system. Right? It has actually some additional structure. It's a kind of canonical transformation. Right? You preserve the form of the Hamiltonian equation. Okay? And this was already known in a related, um, like in the Schrodinger equation, which is not this, but it's related. Okay? And it's still true in the Schrodinger bridge problem. Okay, so this was like our first uh, observation, and so this was for the entropic case, right? So we wanted to say something more for the kind of general gradient, uh, control gradient flow problem. And so we define a kind of generalized half cool transformation by mimicking the classical half cool transformation, right? So from rho and phi, we define uh, eta and eta star, right? So implicitly, so here, of course, you have to assume that the, the derivative of f, but this is the first variation of f, uh, can be inverted. And um, let me give you an example of what you can obtain. So if instead of doing the gradient flow, the control gradient flow of the entropy, which is the classical Schrodinger problem, if you do the control gradient flow of this functional, right, rho square, sometimes called the quadratic Rényi entropy, okay, then this new half call looks like this. But more importantly, uh, in the new variable, the solution, right, the Hamiltonian flow, it still, still looks like a Hamiltonian flow. Okay, so um, you can see that um, right, we're trying to say new things about this uh, Hopkins transformation, and uh, we define it for, like, let's say, uh, any potential, right? If you can invert things, and in some cases you get uh, nice structure. And in fact, uh, we've shown something that's uh, a little bit more general, uh, but I will go a little bit quick here. But uh, what we've shown is like, um, what I said here is true for any kind of control gradient flow. Okay? So actually, surprisingly, it doesn't depend on the vast time metric. Okay? You could do a control gradient flow in, let's say, the fischer rao metric. Okay? And uh, if you look at the entropy or this Rényi entropy, by doing this uh, kind of new half cold transformation, you would still preserve the form of the Hamilton equation. Okay. Um, all right, and I want to um, end this presentation on another um, application, which I still don't really fully understand. So let's just go back to like these nice pictures, right? So this was the control gradient flow picture, right? So we are working on the vast space. And here is maybe a more explicit uh, drawing of what's going on. Um, very similar to the picture that Trifon shows earlier, right? So you start with a pretty peaked Gaussian. Let's say this is in the entropic case, okay? This is what the, the snapshots in time would look like. First you will, you know, diffuse a lot, and then you will go back at the end uh, and then be a little bit more peaked, okay? And it's easy to see by a simple computation that the function f is convex along the flow, okay? So you can see here, right, this is the minus the gradient of f. So of course, f you think of it as a convex function, but this will be the minimizer. So here, f uh, along the flow first decreases and then increases. Okay? And it turns out that it does this in a convex way. Okay? Here is the same. The entropy at the beginning is pretty large because your Gaussian is peaked. Okay? And as time evolves, it decreases and then increases again. Okay? And it does this in a convex way. And we were able to extend uh, pretty intriguing results, a uh, recent result by Giovanni Conforti, who um, found a splitting of your functional into two functionals, w and w star. And along the flow, right, f is convex, and along the flow, w is increasing and w star is decreasing. So you split your uh, convex f into an increasing part and a decreasing part. And also it seems like this is related to a gradient ascent type of uh, ideas, and this is related to the gradient descent. Now, I think the intriguing part, which is what I still don't really fully understand, is that this splitting involves uh, the control B. Okay, so W and W star, in some sense, are defined on phase space. Right? You don't just split F into two functions, but these two depend on the control. Okay. 
So Giovanni uh, Conforti showed this on, uh, for the, in the entropy crest, and, and he showed it rigorously. And uh, we've kind of extended it uh, you know, formally for a larger class of potential, including Rainy entropies, interaction potential, and so on. Okay, so this is just like a simple picture. You have your convex F and uh, W and W star. By the way, they're also convex, but I think the more interesting thing is that one is decreasing and one is increasing. Okay, all right, thank you. I was wondering um, the the K, the, the, the Hamiltonian so that's for the case of Rainy, is it simple? It's not. It's. Uh, I mean, there's a formula. I would say it's uh, too simple, but it's not too complicated. The point. Yeah. It, so the, this new half cool doesn't simplify the uh, the equations, right? But they have. They kind of keep this uh, structure. Yes, right? It's yes, like yes, a canonical. Absolutely. But yeah. it would be too much maybe to ask that. You know, they would also allow us to solve, you know, like the, with yeah. a rainy entropy case. No, it's really nice. Yeah, it's really yeah. Nice. Thank you. All right, thank you.